Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, a Human Element Series. This is episode 202. I'm Chris Hadnagy, CEO and founder of Social Engineer LLC, the Innocent Lives Foundation, and the Institute for Social Engineering. I've been hosting this podcast for, wow, 13 years now, since 2009. It's a long time. Um, so I'm really happy to have uh, this episode. You're really going to like this guest. But before we get to our guest, let's do a few housekeeping things. This episode is sponsored by Social Engineer. I'm really excited about our training uh, offerings for 2023. I know a lot of you have been emailing in and asking us on our Slack channels and other places for putting that calendar out there. So really excited to say that the calendar is finally out there and we're going to do a much better job at that moving forward. So thanks for nagging us and keeping us on our toes and making us do that. But you can see a couple APSE classes out as we have a brand new class, a, a CIRA class and a whole bunch of other new training offerings, which we'll talk about in future episodes. So go over to social-engineer.com and check those out. If you like the topic of social engineering, don't forget to hop onto our Slack channel. Uh, right now we have over 1300 people on there each and every day talking about social engineering, the psychology of it. Uh, we have uh, groups talking about um, um, job boards in there. We have one that I think uh, 10 people found work now through the job board on the Slack channel. Uh, we have groups that get together twice a month and do practice sessions. So it's a really family-friendly uh, legal chat. That's what we like to tell people. If you come in and want to brag about things you did illegally, we're probably going to ask you to leave because we like to learn in that Slack channel. So come on in and join us there if that's what you want. I also invite everyone who's listening to take a moment to go visit innocentlivesfoundation.org. I am just so proud of the team over there. Uh, for the last five years now, we've been working closely with law enforcement. If you're not familiar with our mission, our mission is to work with law enforcement and geolocating and finding people who traffic children and harm children and help law enforcement to apprehend them. Uh, we're not a vigilante group, so we don't do anything like that. We're actually above board and work closely with federal and local law enforcement around the globe. And we have now accomplished over 480 cases. Really proud of the people over there. You can support us by uh, joining in the fight if you have the capability and the time and the desire. Or, of course, we're a nonprofit, so you can donate to the cause. You can do all that at innocentlivesfoundation.org. And last but not least, if you're enjoying the music on this podcast, if you're listening to one of the audio versions, then big shout out for Clutch. You can check them out at pro-rock.com. Uh, you know, if anyone knows me, it's my favorite band on earth. The fact that Neil's on the board for ILF and they allow us to use your music makes me even a bigger fan. So go check them out, give them some love and enjoy the music from the podcast. Okay, let's get to our guest. I'm super excited about having uh, Gina Cox. She's a PhD. And she's a corporate advisor and executive coach. She's also been called a straight shooter, which I can, I can testify to that and spending some time with her at an event. She brings warmth and generosity of spirit to her partnerships. Her job is guiding CEOs, leaders, and boards as they respond to evolving stakeholder expectations and transformation driven by societal change in organic and M&A growth. Her differentiator is the nuanced insights and recommendations she brings from a lifetime of continuous multidisciplinary learning, enabling her to offer clients uniquely invaluable insights. And really exciting, she has a brand new book that just came out, Leading Inclusion. It's available wherever books are sold. We're going to talk about that today. And we'll, of course, we'll have links to it in the show notes. And really what the book is about, it catalyzes executive leaders to drive inclusion from the top of their organizations. Gina, it's wonderful to have you here with me today. Thanks for joining. Oh, and Chris, it's really a delight to be here. You know, when I first met you, I had already known of you uh, from your work and from your book. Uh, and it's been fun to sort of listen to the ways that you have been able to share your, well, acquire knowledge over time and share it with the, your clients. And so I'm just honored to be on the podcast. Thank today. you. Now, when I met you, you were just working on the book. So actually, I don't want to jump to that because I want to, I want people to know who you are first. How did you get into the idea of being a, um, a, a diversity consultant, someone who's going to lead these CEOs and leaders in, into understanding these different times that we're in now. How did that path come about for you? Mm -hmm. Although I'll start by saying that I'm actually not a diversity consultant. I am a leadership uh, advisor and coach. And I'll, you'll see from my explanation in a minute why I make that very specific distinction. But, you know, for decades, I have worked directly with uh, business leaders in some of the largest companies in the, in the country and outside of this country to really help them enhance the quality and the impact of their leaders and also help them build healthy organizational cultures. And those are the two streams in which I operate. 
But over time, you know, as I have been doing that work, I've, I've always said, you know, Gina, you're a bit of a fake, a fraud and a phony. <laughs> because my own personal experiences as an employee of some large organizations over the same decades of time has never been particularly positive. So even as I'm encouraging leaders about what they can do to create these environments, I was operating in environments where every day I was dealing with some of the same challenges that I eventually or that I, I, I knew some of those challenges were caused by the way that I look by who I was. I never brought that to the fore, however, because you know what life is too short, one must just mm-hmm. pursue the goal and just keep moving forward. But uh, in May of 2020, unfortunately, George Floyd was killed. And it caused me to look in the mirror in a much different way. Because I said, for all these years that you have been pretending that these things are not issues, is there any, could there ever be any better time for you to share everything that you know, both from the psychological science, from your personal experiences, from your observations of, of leaders? Is there any better time for you to help and to be a, a part of the solution with this challenge, this uh, inclusion challenge? And so that was the impetus where I said, this is a time for me to really think about what I can do to make a difference. Maybe I won't march in the streets, but maybe I can write a book primarily focused on helping leaders of organizations understand that the things that they should do, the point of view and the stance that they must assume if they're truly going to build inclusive organizations. Uh, and the very last thing I'll say before I, um, you know, this is sort of a, a long introduction or response to your question, but the very last thing I wanted to talk about is that distinction that I made early, earlier. I'm not a diversity consultant. In fact, I don't believe that there's really any such thing as diversity, equity, and inclusion as a thing. I mean, the three words mean something. We know what they mean. But whenever people put them together, what I have discovered is what they mean is that this is going to be a thing that's going to be off to the side that only certain people who look a certain way will deal with. And everybody else will just sort of Hmm. do what they suggest, but sort of with a a high degree of skepticism. So I'm actually a leadership um, consultant because, in fact, diversity, equity and inclusion is nothing more than, you know, strong, impactful leaders for everybody and healthy organizational cultures. So that's that's an interesting differentiator. And also, thank you for um, I don't think that was long at all. That's a great way to describe how you got to where you are. Um, as you were talking about it, I didn't expect that the, the twist. So what I found interesting is um, and I had a question about when you were coming up and you said it was uh, you realized that people were treating you different by the way you looked. Uh, but you just said, I'm going to like, I'm, I don't need to make a, an issue of that. That must have been very frustrating dealing with that for Mm. how many, how many years were you having to go through that before you decided to start talking about it? Well, you know, for decades, but let me Mm. back up a little further. I am an immigrant to this country. And when I, you know, when I was growing up, everybody around me, my friends, my relatives and my loved ones, they all said, Oh, Gina, you're smart. Gina, you can do anything you want to do with your life. Like that was what I learned. And I came to the United States when I was about 20 years old. And it felt like a, yeah, it, it felt like a before and after, like like a, a veil had sort of dropped in the, you know, the experiences I had had up to that point versus what happened after that. I kind of think of it as like a natural experiment because I told you how the before was warm and fuzzy and I was just young and knew that the world was my oyster. But when I came to the United States, I realized that the minute I showed up, people reacted to me in a way that was different than the way that I had been accustomed to being reacted to. Mm. And it was, I, I realized that when I would, they would see me as sort of an avatar of black woman, they wouldn't see Gina necessarily. They would see this person. Oh, okay. Her, the brain quickly classifies her oh, as black woman. So we know what she thinks. We know what she believes. We know how she will behave. Mm. We know how to treat her and so on. So, but then I had to learn what, what does that mean? Cause I was black woman mm. avatar, but I didn't know the experience of it. And that is relevant to your question because ever since then, I sort of have operated as if I were looking down on myself in my experiences in corporate life in the United States and and life in general, because there's a very unique American experience. And in order to be successful, especially in business here, one needs to understand what that is. Do you think that that's a common experience for anyone who comes from a um, like a diverse, like a different background, like someone who's a, who is, I mean, just to say someone who's non-white, a non-white male, do you think that's a common experience to have to have that viewpoint when they're going in business? 
Yeah, I think it's a common experience in this country only because of our demographics and our history. And I don't think we noticed it much. But when you are an immigrant in particular, you really know. I mean, and any immigrant in any country knows that he or she has to learn the ways of that country, the language, the social norms, you know, the, the things that work and don't work. Every immigrant knows that. In the United States, if you are an immigrant who happens to be, I, I'll say, people use the language people of color for convenience sake, so I'll use that. You, you have a second, another layer of stuff that you've got to figure out because there are things that you will have to learn to respond to that you probably never had to respond to in the country from which you came. And so if you come here as an adult in particular, you're like, oh, I need to learn how to be, how not to be, where to be, where not to be. It, you just have to figure that out. But I think that that we're just right now, I'm just talking about this immigrant experience, particularly for people of color. But I think that is also true for anyone who shows up in the various ways that humans vary and humans vary. Human variation is normal. But the, what I see uh, and have learned from decades in corporate life <clears throat> is that organizations do not teach leaders how to deal with normal human variation. And so when, uh, when you show up with a, a physical disability, a neurological uh, variation, if you show up as LGBTQ+, plus, or if you have a different point of view because of some, you know, um, some, some characteristics of your immigrant experience, or what have you, the word different is mm -hmm. automatically applied to you because the, the non-different, meaning the, the norm, the thing you're being compared to, is typically the white experience uh, in America. So, um, th you know, this is going to be probably a very naive question, but how then can, you know, looking at myself, like for this mirror saying, I obviously did not have to deal with that uh, coming up in mm -hmm. business, that same viewpoint that you had to have, like looking down on yourself from the outside and having to view it that way. So how can a leader or organizations make diversity and inclusion stick then? Because yeah. like you said, it so, seems like buzzwords sometimes, right? I didn't mean to cut you off. It yes. seems like buzzwords. So you say, oh, we're going to do this diversity and inclusion thing, you know, and it becomes like you said, like a little package that sits over here on the desk and we open it up and it's like, hey, now we're, we have diversity here, right? So what, right. what is it? What and does it mean? And how do we make it stick? So, so you can tell already that what I say is that what you just described, which is the norm, is the wrong way to do things. People often ask me, Gina, what initiative should we implement? What training should we implement? And I said, I have no idea. Here's, here's mm -hmm. another question I would ask you uh, if you're a leader. What is it that you would like to have accomplished in the next 12 months or the next 24 months that relate to this thing that you're calling diversity, equity, and inclusion? So I listen to what they have to say. And I often, I mean, without fail, I get to listen and then I get to say, oh, so what you're really telling me is you'd like your leaders to behave differently. And you'd like to maybe have a higher representation of different kinds of people in various roles. And maybe you want something that has to do with, you know, respect and the way people relate to one another, because that's a culture that you think can support all employees, including those from the spectrum of variations. So what you're really telling me is you want a better organization. So calling it so and then I, so I frame it that way. And then I say, and here's the thing, you can have that. But have you noticed from that, that this means it is a leadership obligation? Mm -hmm. It's not a moral obligation. It's not any other. This is actually an idea about making sure that your managers and you can lead 100% of the people who either are already in the organization or might show up as candidates for your jobs. And so I do re reframe it that way. And if you do reframe it that way, which I think is the appropriate way, then automatically you realize, well, wait a minute. It's not about training programs. In fact, I recommend you never start there. <laughs> It's about what is the vision that the leader has for what you want your company to be? And then what outcomes do you want to have that you can measure two years from now? And then how do we back into that? And yes, that might lead you to say, well, I wanted, I do want to have somebody on my team who's a specialist in these issues can, to help guide the organization. But it can't be that you hire somebody and call them a, a chief diversity officer or whatever. And then you say here and you throw the ball to them and say, hmm. fix it. And then they go off and do what I'm going to call ad hoc things because they're not connected to a strategy that mm -hmm. does not work. That makes a lot of sense. And almost like if you could apply that same principle, you just said in anything, right? I mean, yes. when you were talking, I was thinking about uh, when I went on a, my health journey to, to get healthy, 
it, you, you know, your first question is, okay, what can I, what supplements can I take or what can I do to lose weight? Right. And the trainer's like, no, you're thinking about it all wrong. Right. It's a, uh, yes. you know, like, and he did the same thing. He was like, what's your goal? Like, where, where do you want to be in 12 months and 24 months and 36 months? And then he's like, now we're yeah. going to work backwards from there. And it was lifestyle change, not take this pill. And all of a sudden you're where you want to be. And it feels like that's what uh, is happening maybe a lot of times uh, with with diversity and inclusion. It's like, OK, well, I I, I bought this this program online and now we're going to be diverse. Right. Mm-hmm, <laughs> and it's, mm-hmm. it's not. It's I not love I love that. I love that analogy, Chris, because here's the other thing that you said that is very profound, which I tell leaders, but you just said it. You would not take that approach to solving any other problem in your organization. Any other issue or challenge, you would assume it required a strategic solution. You wouldn't turn your back from a marketing problem and say, oh, I'll let those people fix it. You wouldn't turn your back from a sales challenge and say, oh, I'll let those people fix it. And then, you know, whatever, I'll give it lip service. You would say, this is what it means for me to effectively run this business is to understand all of the tr- strategic impl- implications of the way we do things. And you would say, I need, a, I need to make sure that this is tied into the way we do things strategically. Why we handle this issue in this way off to the side, I think, is actually the fundamental challenge that is the evidence that we do not understand that this is really an issue about day-to-day employee experiences and therefore mm. is a leadership obligation. So you cannot walk away from a leadership obligation. So how, like, how do you recommend that um, a company organization or a leader think about this? Because I think a lot of times the solution sounds almost silly when you say it, they, like, you know, well, I'll just go, I'll hire, I'll hire a black person then I'll be diverse. Right. Cause we have no black people here. So if I hire one, now I'm diverse, right? That that, that doesn't mm-hmm. make just having different people of different colors doesn't make you diverse, right? Or right. understanding the problem. So how, how do you suggest they even go about managing that at first if you realize it's a leadership problem? Yeah. And so, yes, you might have a goal of greater, of, of greater representation of people by various groups because you might have awakened, awoken one day and discover you didn't have that. And so you might work towards that, although there is always a qualifier. I always say of the available talent in the workforce, because mm-hmm. depending on what you're looking for <clears throat> and where you're looking for it, it might not be as easy to do as just saying, I want to do it. So there's that. But let me go back a little bit and say one more thing that I think is relevant to this conversation, which is that I say inclusion tops diversity. And what do I mean by that? I mean that when you're the leader of an organization, even if you go out and hire people starting tomorrow who don't look like the people you have in the organization today, and you say, I'm not, I'm more diverse. Hallelujah. I'm done. And you think that's the resolution. You're in for a, a, you know, a bit of an awakening, a rude awakening, probably fairly soon, because here, here's the thing. Imagine then that you're the, you're the host of a dinner party. You're the leader. This is your company. You're brought, you've brought these people in. You've invited people to the party. And when they get there, they discover that there's no place setting for them. You had 12 place settings, but you, you hired, you know, you brought 13 people to the party. That 13th person, the latest arrival has come in now with great enthusiasm. I can't wait to taste the wine, eat the meal, figure out what the dessert is and interact with these people. And then they get there. First of all, there was no setting for that person. There was no chair. Everybody is looking at them like, don't you know, we only use our left hand. We don't use our right hand. And you don't, they may not even have a, a place to sit. Well, now they have to figure out do I tell this, do I just stay here and sort of like enjoy the corners of the room as best I can? Or do I say to my new host, my boss, you know, by the way, um, I, I don't have everything I need to, to do this well, or I'm not having the interactions that I need. It's hard to do that because you're this guest that just showed up. So I think bringing in diversity without also thinking about the existing culture and preparing that culture, the leaders in particular, to really make sure that they're gracious hosts for mm-hmm. everyone that they bring into the organization is a recipe for disaster because those new hires, the guests, will not be highly engaged after a certain period of time because they will just be more defensive, uncomfortable, and pro- probably less productive than they can be. And meanwhile, the, the managers haven't learned anything. And so you'll just keep repeating that mistake mm-hmm. over and over. That's a really nice analogy, uh, the, the, the dinner party. Uh, that really helps uh, kind of solidify because it, it really would be mm. it would be up to the the host, like you said, to go, oh, I don't yeah. have a place setting here for you. Let me go fix that almost like let me go get a chair and hey, you guys move down one. We're going to squeeze her in here or whatever. You know, yes. that would be that yes. host's job to do that. Otherwise, 
you're kind of a jerk just standing there saying, oop, I invited you, but there's no place for you to sit. Yes. Yeah, that's that's interesting. In your book, um, you you have this um, acronym you call READI, R-E-D-I, uh, Respect, mm-hmm. Equity, uh, Diversity, and Inclusion. Now, we talked about some of those already, the of diversity and inclusion and how they fit together. But let's talk about these other two, the respect and mm-hmm. equity. What, how do those fit into this equation? So first of all, by law, if you're going to write a book, you got to have an acronym. So I have an acronym, <laughs> right? But yeah. But in all seriousness, I didn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. The, the words diversity, equity, and inclusion means have come to mean something over the years. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what they mean. I, I've already talked about inclusion a little bit. Obviously, diversity is all about representation. You know, what is the proportion of people from certain groups that you have relative to the available labor force? That's diversity. The E um, is equity. So E stands for equity and equity is different than equality. So for example, when I'm thinking about equity, uh, and, and what organizations to be thinking about is it's not so much like, is everybody getting the same thing? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about are people getting what they need in order for them to, for them to be successful in all the different ways that they need you know, to be supported. Everybody doesn't need the same thing. Everybody doesn't need the same outcome. Mm. So that's what equity is about. It's more about sort of the, of helping people to be their best. And then th- you said the acronym was ready. It starts with the letter R. So we're kind of working backwards, but that R stands for respect. And my model is called a respect first model, very simply, because what I discovered in the summer of 2021, as I was doing research for the book, I talked to about 30 different executives and I asked them, what is it that is getting in the way of you leading the conversation about inclusion in your organization? They were very honest with me. They said, sometimes they would say, well, I, we're not sure this even belongs on our plate. And by the way, Chris, you know that I think very differently, of course. <laughs> yes. Number two, they would say, um, well, our advisors say, you know, this stuff is such a hot potato. You're darned if you do and you're darned if you don't. Mm. So maybe we just need to sit tight and keep a little bit below the radar and don't pop our heads up too high until we figure out what's going on. So I, I thought legitimate. I get that. And then the third thing they would say is, you know, I'm not really sure, Gina, what it is that those people who would be the beneficiaries of this effort, all of these different kinds of people, I'm not really sure what they want. So then I did a survey of, a, of over 500 American em, employed Americans. And the, the, within that sample, I had 159 black women. And that was actually, it was intentional that I would have a large number of black women. I'll explain that if you remind me. Hmm. But when I asked them a similar question about what is it that you want your leaders to know about inclusion? What do you wish that they would do? They say, we already know they don't understand. We already know, we feel like they don't want to, they avoid us, you know, they avoid us physically, like not avoiding eye contact and not being in our physical presence. But they also avoid the issues that we keep saying over and over are important to us, the outcomes that we desire. Therefore, we interpret that as disrespect, a lack of respect, because if you respected me, you would be concerned about the things that are, uh, are problematic and the good things, but the things that I care about, you would want to know about those. And if I raised the problem, you'd want to fix it. And so, especially the black women in the sample, were ver- their language was very clear about this. They want respect first. And that all the other things that organizations do, if they don't make sure that they have respectful environments, cultures, none of the other things that they want to accomplish mm-hmm. within, within this domain will be meaningful or will they, nor will they last. You know, I find um, interesting when you were talking about the three different a- kind of answers you got from the, the, the leaders that you surveyed um, in security. So in our industry, you know, we, we deal with trying to help people be more secure and learn how to teach their people to be secure. So a lot about educating your staff and employees. And I hear almost identical the answers that you just said that you got for why uh, this may not be our problem. Like they say, I'm not as a leader. Look, I got a lot to do. I'm not sure that's why I delegated to others. Or they'll say, I don't know if this is really something we can fix. So like almost like the ostrich syndrome, I'm just going to keep my head in the sand and I'll pop it up if we get hacked, you know, and then we'll figure it out. But then you have that third group who was like the group that actually was pretty honest. You know, they were, you know, they came and they were like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to do to fix it. And to me, that's at least an honest answer. If you say, I don't know, then yes. it's at least you're saying like, well, teach me. So um, I, f- I find that interesting that the, uh, the comparisons between the two, because it, uh, they're obviously both big problems, but 
it seems like leaders may be approaching these big problems in very similar ways. Uh, mm-hmm. now, I don't have the mm-hmm. data you have from that, that survey. Is- so that's an interesting, just an interesting um, comparison. Yeah. Well, that you're, I appreciate your sharing that your insight about that, because here's the funny thing. I have a friend who is a board director and she put a post on LinkedIn a couple of days ago that basically just said something about maybe organizations should all have something like a chief transformation officer. Hmm. So it, it was a very mundane article. It wasn't anything provocative really, but that was what it was about. And a bunch of people jumped onto the article in response and half of them, some of them said yes. And then some, a bunch said, we don't need a chief transformation officer. This, this, the executives are supposed to be in charge of all of this. And, you know, they like to bring in consultants and they went down a certain path. And then I saw the article and I responded and I said, well, you know what? I don't have any fight with this article because what I am seeing is that the world is changing so very quickly that executive teams are challenged to keep up with all of the changes. So they have to figure out what are they going to focus on? They need, the executive team needs to keep squarely focused on that long-term view on the strategy and understanding what works and what doesn't work so they can tweak, move the ship, tweak it to the left or tweak it to, to the right. But underneath that, there are a whole bunch of very specific technical issues that have to be addressed, including cybersecurity and so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so they have to figure out how are you going to handle that? And so obviously not handling it is not going to get you a solution, but that is, I think, what sometimes happens when these are issues that are so thorny that maybe they bring political, you know, concerns or, uh, you know, crisis management concerns or all the other things that you see in your business. And so maybe we'll just wait and see. Meanwhile, though, the problem is still there. The vulnerability is absolutely still there, maybe getting worse. And somebody's watching to see what you're going to do. And so what she was saying about the chief uh, transformation officer was to make the point that, yes, if you, you as the executive, you can't do everything, but you must have a trusted advisor within your organization at a certain level that can then speak to the whole organization about these issues and focus on them. And so I think that is the similarity that I see that I don't think some organizations are taking advantage um, or, rec- you know, they're not necessarily doing that. Yeah. And, and in security, we do have that, right? So we have the chief information security officer or the CISO. And yes. that's a role that many large organizations, they hire for that. And that person mm-hmm. usually works directly with the CEO, but they're in charge of making sure security is a priority in in the company. Um, mm-hmm. So I can almost see that being like whatever that C-level title is, but you have someone who there is in charge to make sure that the company, I still love your analogy of that dinner party, that there are seats and place settings for everyone that you're bringing into the company ready for them when they arrive. Yeah. So yeah, organizations do hire in the past. They were often called chief diversity officers. I think as, as the word inclusion is becoming clearer in terms of what it means, I'm seeing more big companies call them chief inclusion officers, but there, so there are companies trying to do that. The problem though, and I don't, I guess CISOs probably have this problem too, <laughs> is that the organizations will hire these chief diversity officers, but they will not provide them with the resources that they need, the political clout that they need to make the big decisions. And so they're often frustrated because the whole issue that we just talked about that I say, I I hate it, the term diversity, equity, inclusion, but let's Mm -hmm. call it that. Let's call it ready. That whole thing, uh, the way that it is handled ultimately, even with the the, the chief diversity officer, is that the executive team behaves as if they would rather not know about it. They don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. With cybersecurity, is that how it's handled? Uh, That depends on the organization, right? So I find that organizations that tend to treat security like a priority, it is from top down and it's very important. Like we we work with this really large bank and we'll be phishing them and the CEO is included in every test and he wants it that way. And when they do big meetings, he'll sometimes even say, man, I fell for this month's phishing and it makes it Okay. It makes it not a bad thing. Right. And when I see companies Mm -hmm. like that, they always do so good when it comes to security, right? They're, they're thinking their process, their managers all handle it different. Cause it's like, well, if dad is being cool, then everyone below him is being cool. Right. But then you have some companies who it's not like you actually, I've had CEOs even say, well, this is for them. Don't include me in the audits. Don't include me in the test. And it's like, oof, well, you're not even eating your own, your own medicine, right? You're not taking your own medicine. So those companies tend to have, a weird culture about security, like where people are afraid to get, they might get fired if they fail. And that's scary. Like I, I don't really like working with that because 
you know, with, when it comes to security and humans, and you probably found this in your industry the same, there's going to be failure, right? There's going to be because we don't understand it all. Mm-hmm. And if people are afraid of losing their employment because they fail, oh, that's a culture that, <laughs> that lends to stress and all sorts of bad things. Yeah. And it's amazing to hear, again, all of the analogies, all of the similarities, because it's the very same thing in the organizations where the the top level or the top level leaders get intimately involved in some small way. Well, clearly in a big way in setting the vision, but in some small way in understanding these different particular challenges in your your case, cybersecurity, in my uh, case, the, the employee experience. They have a, they get a certain level of insight that they don't get otherwise. And their personal insight is what then makes it possible for them to make great decisions about the thing that can then be cascaded consistently and actually have the impact that is desired. And when you don't have that, it doesn't work. So you and I are, uh, I think I, I love this because my whole book is about this very issue. And that's, and they're very few. I haven't seen another book written specifically for leaders about this issue. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I wanted to write that book. Yeah, that, that, that is interesting. And the similarities are interesting. So I found with me that um, I, I'm happy that I, I know I don't know everything and I have a great team. So I can go to people on my team and say, Hey, what can we do better about this? Or what can we do better for you? Or, you know, I have single moms on my team and you'll say like, so what can we do here better to make it easier for your role, like your role in life to have your mm-hmm. job? And cause I don't know. Cause you know, like I'm, I'm, I have, I have my wife here. I have my kids. Uh, you know, I'm a white male. So my experience in the world is much different than hers. And I wouldn't know how to make the place setting right for her. Um, and, mm-hmm. and I know I don't know that. So instead of trying it and failing, I'll just go, Hey, talk to me. Tell me what we can do yeah. here. Is there a better way of getting that knowledge? Do you think so that way you don't make a mistake on doing that? The truth is you're just hitting the nail on the head again from my perspective, because the fact that you said you were asking a question means that you already understand or you, you have this awareness that the solutions that to these problems often lie not with you having to create the solution, but with people who are having the experience defining what the real problem is and also being involved in co-creating the solution. That's not new language. It's not new language in technology, in the tech world, but it is language that is not used sufficiently. And so I say in order to get to the outcomes that we're desiring in this, this ready world work that we talk about, they're really sort of three C's. It starts with curiosity, which leads to connection which leads to comfort. And by curiosity, I simply mean it is really important to understand what it is that you're trying to, that what is it? What is the it? In this case, we're talking about how people vary. Well, you have to ask questions and the best way to get these, to get to figure out what it is, is to be curious to yourself, ask these questions, have people, other people who ask these questions, use surveys, do whatever you do, but don't presuppose that you know what the problem is and definitely don't make the, the decisions about the solutions at the top of the organization without having clear input from the stakeholders. Another thing is, if you don't do that, then you don't get to the level of connection with those folk who you're trying to serve, in this case, employees who happen to vary in a variety of ways. But once you do step one, it does lead to connection because they recognize when you ask people questions, the first thing that they infer is that you're interested. The second thing they feel is that you, you, you're you willing to empathize, perhaps, or perhaps you realize now that I know more, I can empathize because I didn't know this before. Now that I know it, I do this other thing. And so connection is that second C. Second C leads to the third C. And the third C is comfort. And and comfort is a word that even the word itself is like a, an embrace. It's kind of warm, Right. What we are lacking in the work world and in the world in general, I think, about these issues is that we're so afraid of one another. We don't have the curiosity. We don't have the connection. We never get the chance to get to the comfort phase. Mm -hmm. And so everything feels different. Everybody feels different. Everything feels scary. And so I go back to the fundamentals. You know, I think we need to have those three C's, especially leaders. You need to understand the issue, whether it's cybersecurity uh, or whether it's ready with that degree of um, connection to it. And I actually understand that I could empathize on that in both ways, because sometimes I'm so worried about messing up that it feels easier to just put your head in the sand and go, Mm -hmm. I'll wait until someone tells me what to do. Right. Um, But at at least here, what I'm really happy about my team is that we're all pretty easy going about, hey, look, we know we're going to make mistakes. So let's just work through it together. 
kind of thing. And we're not talking about major, you know, like you may, you may just not have thought through this one thing and now you're like, Oh, we got to make a change. But, um, is it up to do you, like you, when you talk to companies, do you encourage employees to, to feel comfortable to come to management and say, Hey, like this place setting isn't right for my life. Are there things mm-hmm. that we can do to change it? Is that something that you yeah. encourage people to do? Oh, I always encourage people to do it, but I also know how hard it is. And like I told you, I myself never did that for mm-hmm. many, many years. And it's hard because if you work in an organization that has given you the vibe that speaking up and speaking out is taboo, you're never going to do it. So I do encourage those employees to do that. But I all, I start first by asking the leaders, what is the nature of the current environment about speaking out? Because guess what? If you haven't created an environment where people know, number one, they, like you said, they can make mistakes. Number two, they can say something that not everybody agrees with and they can still get along with their coworkers tomorrow. Then it would be irrational to expect that people will speak up and speak out. Um, I once worked for a financial services company that was acquiring another, a smaller financial services company in another state. And I was working at the home, the, the acquiring company. And one day I walked by the mail room back in the days when we had big mail rooms. Mm. And I knew everybody in that mail room. And I was like, what are you guys laughing about? What's so funny? And they said, oh, we're laughing because every day the folks in uh, Detroit send down like 50 different FedEx packages as part of this due diligence process. They're sending all these documents. And we here in this location, we send them about another 50 different you know, packages from different parts of the company that go to that location. So every day we're handling about a hundred different packages. Um, and we're like, you know what? All they need to do is maybe have a, a morning pickup and an afternoon pickup in the two locations. We can handle four different shipments Everything would be consolidated and easy to control. We would know when they were coming. It would be easier to distribute them and the company would save money. And I'm like, well, why don't you tell somebody that? Oh, yeah, we don't tell people anything anymore because we've learned that no matter what we say, nobody's listening to us. Mm. And I never forgotten that experience because that's really the thing that leaders have that I ask leaders. Do you have an environment where the mailroom person can tell you how best to get an efficiency uh, or do you think that their opinions don't really matter? That is a phenomenal story. Uh, terrible, but a phenomenal yeah. story because that idea, as you were saying it, I'm like, that's genius, right? Like I would want somebody to tell me that saving me time, yes. money, effort, like that's genius. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why I say, you know, I, I do not like people that say the solutions to the kinds of challenges that we, that I, that I focus on have got to be complicated or, or, or they need to be some special secret sauce. I don't believe that. I think that there has been something in our country that has set this all up to seem even way more complicated than it is. And if you take it just down to the level of humans interacting with one another, leaders looking out for a hundred percent of the people, I call them designated hitter leaders because mm-hmm. that really, makes it clear that that's their one job. Um, I think then you get to realize that all of this stuff that we're talking about, that seems diversity, equity, and inclusion <laughs> makes it seem so foreign. It, it doesn't have to be that way. Well, I want to say your, your book on Amazon has got five stars, which is impossible uh-huh. for a book to have, right? I mean, <laughs> no one has five straight stars and that's amazing. And, um, and it's, it's wonderful. And I, I do agree with a lot of the reviews on there. It's uh it is a unique type of book about this topic uh, made for people who are in a leadership position. So we're definitely going to mm-hmm. have a link for it in the, in the show. Thank notes. you. Uh, so besides your book, I got a couple, I got a couple of questions as we, as we wrap up uh, first, if people want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Like where's the best place for them to go and learn what you're doing or to mm-hmm. connect with you on, on social media? Yeah, absolutely. They definitely can find me on LinkedIn. I do most of my social life. I live most of my social life on LinkedIn and I'm at Gina Cox. Uh, so it's my name is Gina with an E, G-E-N-A-C-O-X. So you can find me at Gina Cox on LinkedIn. I have the same handle on Twitter. Uh, on Instagram, I'm at Gina Cox PhD. I don't do as much on Instagram, but I am there. Uh, and you can always go to my website, which is www.ginacox.com uh, to learn a little bit more about me and the work that I do. Perfect. And anyone who's listening, we'll have all of those links in the show notes. So you don't have to remember all that, especially if you're driving. Um, besides your book, which we'll have in the show notes, we always ask our, our guests for a book recommendation. And it doesn't have to be about this topic. It could be just something you read. And you love that book and you want other people to read it. Is there a book that um, or, or it could be one or two or anything that you read recently that you love? 
<laughs> you know, I read so many books that I, it's always hard to, to narrow them down, but absolutely. I think just today, in fact, I posted about a book on LinkedIn. The book is called, Can We Talk? Can We Talk? And it's written by another uh, consultant like myself and coach. But I have a belief that one of the fundamental challenges that we have as humans um, is we don't always know how to, to talk about the things that are difficult in our lives, mm -hmm. right? And if we could just master that, so much, so many problems could be, could be solved. So the book, Can We Talk, is about that. And it relates to the work that I do because I think a lot of this so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff is also about people not making eye contact and not having real conversations. Mm -hmm. So uh, the book, Can We Talk, um, by... Um, uh, Matt, but Madison, M-A-T-U-S-O-N is the last name, M-A-T-U-S-O-N. Um, Roberta Madison is a good book. Um, I happen to actually right now be reading TED Talks. <laughs> uh, this is the book, the original TED Talks book, and I'm reading it because I, I'm preparing myself for a TED Talk. But the thing oh, about the TED Talk congrats. book and the TED Talk concept, thank you. Uh, that I absolutely would recommend to anyone, even if you're not planning to do a TED Talk, is that I've figured out the secret uh, that they're trying to convey. I figured out what it is, that they're, what makes them so compelling. And in the book, they explain to you this concept of a through line, you know, the importance of really being very, very clear about an idea that you want to convey. So whether you're trying to influence your boss, your coworkers, or what have you, the idea of a through line um, and being very clear about those big ideas is something that I have found to be invaluable. Mm -hmm. Those are two good, re great recommendations. You know, I I learned a lot. I had the, a chance to give a TEDx talk, and um, when I, when mm -hmm. they assigned someone to work with me, and you know, they I had my topic, and they said, "Can you just? We don't care how long. Can you just record yourself giving your speech on this topic and send it to us?" And I did. And this guy said, "Okay, well, you're going to take that 45 minutes and do it in 11." And I said, "There's absolutely yeah. no way. That's 45 minutes." Yes. That talk was 11 minutes and five seconds. I can't, I still to this day can't believe that we got yes. it narrowed down and I feel it was the best. Uh, like this sounds so braggy, but it was the best speech I ever gave. I'm still like, to the, I hate watching myself. Yes. And I actually watched that and go, that was actually good. Right. <laughs> and it's, it's their concept. Yeah. It's the way they can it's, boil down all the fluff yes. and get rid of it and just make it perfect. Exactly. And so I, I, so my point I think is that even at this, you know, I've done enough speeches in my time, but focusing on preparing for TEDx has really helped me to be much clearer about what it is I'm trying to convey. And these are skills that all of us can use, even on a podcast, mm -hmm. let's say. <laughs> yes, very true. Um, and last, I'd like to ask you, uh, we, all of us, we've gotten to where we are because there's been people who have helped us along the way. Uh, who would you consider to be mm -hmm. your greatest mentor or maybe greatest mentors in your life? Yeah, um, I'll quickly mention two, because I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that the number one mentor in my life is my maternal grandmother, who is now deceased. Her name was Beryl. But but I, I, I she has I have never felt like she has left my side as a as an ideal of of what good looks like um, in terms of how you treat people and, and all of that. And also she was she has been an ideal in terms of how you get things done, because from her, I learned you don't have to have a lot. What you have to have is a, a passion about something and then you do it and you, you do it consistently and you just keep doing it. And before you know it, you achieve the thing. She's really good at that with just like a, a equivalent of a sixth grade education. So, and whereas, you know, I have a PhD and I, I don't think I have accomplished as much as she has. Yeah. Um, so I'll mention her, but I also quickly mentioned somebody. His name is Lawrence Hamilton and he is someone that he would might not call himself a mentor, but I always think of him. Because I knew him earlier in my career when I was working in human resources departments and he was a chief human resources officer for a Fortune 500 company and we would have these conversations and he would just tell it like it is. And so what I learned from him is just watching um, what he was doing and what he was not doing. And so he has been a mentor through in the sense of me observing him. And of course, sometimes he gives me has given me direct advice and I really value that. A lot of times when we have guests come on and they mention their family, if maybe their family's not with them anymore, but I always love hearing those stories about, uh, you know, the grandmas or the grandpas that did those things and, and made that effect. And I find a lot of times they didn't even, when I ask people, like, do you think she knew? And I don't know. Well, let me ask you this before I say it. Do you think grandma knew that she was teaching you all these life lessons? I think she knew she was teaching me something. I don't know if she ever knew the impact that it had. And I, you know, I, I remember, I don't think she realized that I was really paying attention. 
I put yeah. it that way, you know, I'm, and then that's something it. that you kind of regret. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. It is a regret, but many people have said the same thing that it's afterwards, after they've grown up and they start to ponder on these life experiences as children, like, wow, yeah. grandma taught me this thing that I didn't know was going to impact my life. So, so deeply ever. Yeah. Yeah. But Chris, it does not, does not mean then that, you know, we spend so much time trying to be like somebody else or to do something a certain way or whatever. And I, I really believe in trying to get back to the basics whenever you can to figure out oh, why do you care about this particular thing so much? If, if you can figure that out and then you, you know, you find that the little things are the things that keep you going. It's not usually the big things, the fancy things. It's, <laughs> it's just that little thing inside of you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love that. That's a great message, by the way. Um, it is true. When you talk to even some of the most wealthiest or accomplished people, their accomplishments aren't about the thing that they have. You mm-hmm. know, it's it's about it's usually about something very family orientated or their child being born or their favorite pet or something like that. One memory that yes. really is their accomplishments. Right. I love that. Mm-hmm. Thank you mm-hmm. so much uh, for coming on the show today and sharing all of your knowledge with us and this wonderful book. Um, I know people will really enjoy it after they listen to this, getting to read it. So I, I just can't, can't thank you enough for being with us today. Oh, it's really been a pleasure, uh, Chris. Thank you for having me. And thanks everyone for listening. Next month, we'll be back on the Human Element series with a skip tracer. If you don't know what that is, you'll find out. But Alex Guru will be with us here uh, next month. So we'll see you then. See you.